She's like the female James Bond. She's the safety chick. The safety chick. I love that safety chick. That's yeah. She calls herself the safety chick. I was a stalking victim, having to learn every possible aspect of personal safety to stay alive. The safety chick. We love her. Yeah. Hey, Kathleen Gallagher here, the safety chick. And according to the National Center for Victims of Crime, 7.5 million Americans are stalked annually. But proving a case of stalking is not easy. I know firsthand because I was part of passing the first anti-stalking laws in the country. Victims must prove a laundry list of behavior in order to get their stalker arrested. Obtaining a restraining order is difficult as well. If you are being stalked, you basically need to become your own case manager and work with the police to prove a case of stalking. My guest today did just that and was able to get her stalker arrested more than once. Lenora Claire was stalked by a man she met one time. He then began sending her extremely disturbing letters that escalated into graphic rape and death threats that ultimately led to his arrest. I wanted to have Lenora on the show today to share her story of tenacity and strength in getting her stalker arrested and her crusade to help other victims as well. Lenora, it is so great to have you here. So your story is amazing. So for our listeners and viewers, you got to start from the very beginning when you're, you're in the art studio. Okay, go. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, you got it. I'm going to try and talk fast like the Micro Machines man. But before I start, I want to say how nice it is to be here with you, be able to talk survivor to survivor. And and honestly, I always say you, you really were the trailblazer. So I can't start my story Aww. without thanking you for, for your work, right? So um, where it comes for me, my story began, I was sort of, it feels embarrassing to say now, but um, in L.A., I was sort of a, an it girl. You know, I was I was throwing parties and I, I had a lot going on. And I had opened up my art gallery. It was a very proud moment for me. And I was named one of the L.A. Weekly People of the Year. I say that not to, you know, rest on my laurels, but it's, it's relevant to my story. Um, there was a schizophrenic man. I'm sorry, schizoaffective. He's a combination of schizophrenia and bipolar. And I also want to preface by saying that I'm not insinuating that all people who struggle with mental illness are dangerous, but my stalker is in fact dangerous. So it's important to know that. But he was back in 2011. He had already been stalking Ivanka Trump in New York. I had no idea this is going on. Why would I? I'm living in L.A. He had been arrested multiple times for stalking Ivanka, including um, he tried to kill himself in her store. So this oh, is all Lord. going on. I, wait, wait, wait. Right. When was that? What year was that? Uh, I think that was 2010. Got it. So here, here's this problem person already stalking other people, stalking girls from his high school, stalking Ivanka, all out in New York. I, I don't know any of this. Why would I? Um, I opened up my art gallery 2011. It's a really wonderful moment for me. A lot of press, a lot of wonderful things happening. So I'm on the inside of, of the LA Weekly, this big issue. And he has jumped bail in New York for the charges and everything with Ivanka. He comes to LA. He opens up the magazine, sees me, becomes fixated, comes to my art gallery. He's wearing a spacesuit, which, a spa you know, I wait, have a high time. A, sp a yes. spacesuit? Like, what do you mean? Like an astronaut suit? Yes, like a, like a Halloween, like a spacesuit costume. And, you know, I have a high tolerance for art shenanigans. And I have a lot of, like, fun, eccentric types that come to my gallery. So I'm like, okay, Ziggy Stardust. You know, I think it's kind of funny. <laughs> I don't really know anything. Right. So, you know, I start, I start talking to him. Uh, sorry again. His 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 real name is Justin Masler, but he's legally had it changed to Cloud Star Chaser, which sort of makes more sense why he's got this like well, space man persona. And that that would be your first clue that this person is a bit imbalanced in some way. Right. Like, yes. Right. But I, but again, I, I I meet all kinds of artists with crazy names, so it doesn't immediately red flag because I have all kinds of fun eccentric characters that I meet all the time who are harmless and wonderful. So anyways, he shows up in the gallery and he introduces himself. I can tell right away he's highly intelligent, but off. Something doesn't feel right. And he starts telling me, oh, you look like Jessica Rabbit. You look like Lilu from The Fifth Element. I'm like, okay, yeah, yeah, I, I hear that sometimes. Thanks. And then he looks me right in the eye and I'll never forget that. And he says with just the most intense way, and I'm going to stalk you. And I'm just like, what? Like, it's it's really jarring. And no, who says that to anybody, right? No one says that. So I realized whatever his deal is, this, this guy is creeping me out. So we kick him out of the gallery. I don't think much of it. Just like, okay, weird incident, whatever. Guy's kicked out. He leaves. 
it, then I start getting, I start telling my friends and they're sending me, you know, different articles about him and how I think the Trumps had hired bounty hunters to extradite him back in New York to stand trial. And he eventually goes to Rikers Island where he starts writing me handwritten letters to my gallery. So wait, and, hold on, hold on one second. Mm -hmm. So he was, how did he get back to Rikers? What was the, bounty the impetus? Hunters. The bounty hunters, because he was out on bail and the bounty hunters came and retrieved him and brought him back to New York. Wow, that's lucky. Um, well, it wow. wasn't, not really, because he wasn't held for very long. New York has some pretty terrible laws for stalking. So while he is at Rikers, very briefly, um, for the crimes towards Ivanka, he starts writing me these very, just weird, they start off just very sort of long ramblings. They weren't, they didn't start off threatening, they were just bizarre. And he was sending them handwritten to my gallery, just like page after page of just nonsensical whatever. And it was the kind of thing where it's like, okay, this is alarming, but it's not a threat yet. But then as soon as he got out and had access to the internet, it very rapidly started to escalate to very graphic rape and death threats. And when I say that, I, I, I graphic, horrifying. Was he sending these to you um via what what email account? I mean, was he physically yes, sending my, letters? Go ahead. At this point, at this point, I had closed my art gallery partly because I was creeped out and I started working in television and I had a website. So he would send me emails through my website and every social media, you know, we're on all the social media. So I would be getting tweets and Instagram and Facebook uh, communications from him. Wow. Yeah. So, so go ahead. So at what, so when you got, Let's go back to when you got that first, you know, yeah, weird. Things are adding up. You now mm -hmm. know who he mm -hmm. is. You now know who he went mm -hmm. back to Rikers and then released it. How did you get that information? Because this is a big, you know, this is a big thing about the problem with stalking is that the victim rarely is given any information when the stalker gets out of jail or prison. You have no idea where this guy is, usually. Um, unless yeah. you hire private security or, or you know, a, a PI. So how did you, how were you able to know that he even got out of Rikers? Right. So you make excellent points. And my case is an anomaly for so many reasons. You know, I'm in the 3% what they speculate is the stranger stalking. And what makes mine even more unique is that my stalker stalks celebrities mostly. I'm one of the least known people, people that he stalks. So his was reported. I was able to Google him and, you know, find a, a New York Post article or whatever who was uh, sort of updating about the case, right? So I, I had access to information that most people don't normally have. So what ended up happening was, this is just sort of timeline-wise, I would say 2012, early 2013. Um, I'm getting these graphic death and rape threats. I go to LAPD Northeast Division uh, I show them the, you know, very heavily documented everything. And this person has a, a long criminal history. So I walk in with the assumption, you know, that they're going to care. And the Northeast officer at LAPD tells me to dye my hair and get off the Internet. That's their advice. To OK, me. hold on a minute. You're talking 2013. Yeah. Now I'm now I'm I didn't realize that because oh, we, yeah. we started a tap. The Association of Threat Assessment Professionals in 1991, yes. when we passed the first, yeah. it was a state law then, and then went on to be yeah. federal, right? So LAPD was the first um, police department to even have a stalking I unit. I am blown right. away. Get, oh, yeah. Get, and, and actually, I want that guy's this, this name after we talk. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Well, I mean, my case is with TMU now, but I'm just taking it back to 2013. So right. they, they tell me, dye my hair, get off the Internet. They also tell me that because he's you know transient and doesn't have a fixed address, even though I'd qualify for a restraining order, good luck serving him. Don't bother. You don't know where he is. So I left feeling very dejected and very upset. And then they just, you know, what started happening was I would just get these regular threatening communications from him. So at this point, I started becoming more vigilant. I learned how to track IP addresses. And so I would see every day when I'd get my death or rape threat, what part of the country he was in. So I'd be able to, you know, a, a sort of evaluate and assess my level of risk for the day and then act appropriately. If he was in California, I was on high alert. If he was, you know, in Hawaii, which is a place he was intermittently, um, you know, I'd, I'd be less threatened. So then we get into... 
to about two years of this, which is so weird to say. I just I just normalized my death and rape threats. Like you should never say that, but that is that is what happened. And then in 2015, he sent my boss a death threat. And then it was a whole series of death threats. And then I went back to LAPD and I was met with the same response. And now you, I'm pissed. Now, are you kidding me? Yes. I, I am blown away right now. Oh, I yeah. mean, I, I do oh, yeah. hear this. Look, I do hear this all the time. It, it, yeah. Even in 2021, I know that it still is very difficult to prosecute stalkers. Uh, we still have to be our own case manager, as as I was, as you were, as we teach our victims, right? That, that you yeah. have to be proactive and you have to do this. But I just right. can't believe um, that they were still so archaic um, back then. Oh, um, oh they, yes. That's, that's oh, yes. unacceptable. Right. So as part of my journey, I'm, I'm the kind of person I was as horrified as, as you are, you know, and you've got all this knowledge. I was horrified to learn this. I think, OK, I work in television. This is bullshit. So in 2015, I went public with my story. I did a TV show. That's where I connected with Rhonda Saunders, who I know you go way back with. And then I started started my journey as being more of an advocate and advocate. I started coming up with all kinds of different ideas to improve legislation. I connected with Congressman Schiff. I started, you know, working with him on things. All the, all the meanwhile, as my story is sort of hitting the media, nobody's helping me. Nobody's doing anything. So in 2016, we started filming what would turn into a two hour special on 48 hours. The last hour was all about my case. And we're starting to realize I'm doing all the work, putting things together, realizing how many victims there are. It's multi-state. Like I'm, I'm realizing and, you know, compiling everything, doing all wait, the work Wait, 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 wait. You're, you're realizing that he, your stalker, had been stalking other yeah. victims around the country? Oh, right. Yeah, like so many, so many. So I start, put, cause, because what would happen was as, as I would do an interview with the media, different people would see it because they were also Googling him and contact me and then they disclosed to me what their experience was. So now I'm compiling all of this. So as we're, as we're filming my 48 hours episode, without my consent, they decided to interview my stalker. Yes, I absolutely would hurt people with no qualms and no apology. I could kill people with my bare hands. Are you kidding me? Or I'm an extremely fucking dangerous person. You know, I'm Jesus Christ. I'm a God and I have real divine powers. And yes, I will fucking take the law into my own hands. Does Lenora Claire have a reason to be afraid of you? You're damn right I'm a scary fucking person. I terrify the fucking shit out of people. Yeah, a lot of restraining orders are not legal, though. It is, it is morally justified and legal to break that law. Lenora Claire wants you to stop sending her stuff. Right. She's part of the Zionist network. And they got all these girls that have me fucking framed out to be crazy when I'm really the Messiah. People need to learn that I don't have a lot of respect for fear. Lenora Claire's story is, is basically all lies. When she said there were rape threats, that was a parody film concept I sent her. If Lenore Claire is going to be a Zionist, a part of like a Zionist conspiracy, then we've got to find a way to get her out of social power. Can't have like women like that fucking up our social matrix. Like man up a little bit, you know? Those restraining orders aren't legal. I will not stop sending them. I will use the power of God to fucking destroy anyone who opposes me. I will not stop and I will fucking destroy you. So try stopping me. You die. I will kill them all. They will die. You will not stop me from sending messages. And if you try, you will die. I will not stop sending emails to Lenora Claire. I will kill you. I will destroy you. So, and it was interesting too, because when I had done media prior to that video, I had people, victim blaming me, shaming me, saying I was making it up, that I just wanted attention, even though I'm like, I've been on TV since I was six years old. If I wanted attention, that's, that's not anything I need to create. So it kind of shifted the narrative. You know, wait, I just, I, Lenora, I, I have this quote from Patty Hearst. She said, hmm. if you want to be in movies or um, if you want to be on TV or be in movies, wait tables, don't get kidnapped. That was kind of her thing, you know, and right. it's the same right. kind yeah. of thing where, yeah, oh, yeah, we want exactly. this notoriety because we, you know, yeah. forget we have these yeah, crazy men not, after us, you know. Yeah, it's ridiculous. It's not glamorous or exciting. We're, we're scared for our lives. So, so anyway, so they ended up interviewing my stalker. They realized just the level of threat I was under. They bring in Chris Mahandi, who evaluates. They ended up picking up my stalker in Utah. This is 2016 at this point. And while he's held, uh, a, a week later, Trump wins. I always say, regardless of how you feel politically, that I, I won the stalking lottery because 
I share my stalker with his daughter, right? So, right. so I'm like, right? I'm like the one instant, person that's you know, instant I, security, instant. You right, know, you would right? you would think so. So a week later, after the election, I'm I'm walking this little one. I'm I'm picking up you know her mess, and I get a phone call. I I shit you not. It was LAPD and Secret Service because my stalker had actually broken out of the psych facility they had put them in. And just to sort of circle back to your point about how we're normally not informed, because the states don't all work together, had my stalker not also stalked Ivanka Trump, I would not have known that my stalker had broken out like the Joker from Batman. Like he literally escaped a psych facility. Wow. And I where, was now super, where, was, right. where was that facility? What Utah. part of the country? It was Utah. He, it was in he, Utah. It was Utah. Yes, it was in Utah. He was going to be transferred to Nevada, and that's how he escaped. So wow. I get this call from Secret Service. I'm told he's on the run. Of course, I'm super terrified thinking he knows I put him in there. Now I'm at this level of risk. But then I also think, well, Ivanka's now the first daughter. She's even more exciting to him than me. And sure enough, a week later, he's caught a block away from Trump Tower. He's not even supposed to be in the state of New York under his probation terms. So now I'm thinking he's he's going to get some real time and, and no he doesn't and also i should back up a little bit so during this time vice did an article on me where they called me the aaron brockovich of stalking and once that went viral i started getting people from all over the country writing me and i would teach them you know how to obtain a restraining order and sort of go over risk minimization so i'm doing all this advocacy and and work with other people trying to help them through their situations but like nobody's helping me mine so um so my stalker He's okay. So we're just, I'm trying to timeline wise it. So, it's a, yeah. Tw- so he got 20, out. Of, yeah, 2017. He, got, he, he escaped. And Correct. how did he get picked back up? Uh, he got picked up by Secret Service by Trump Tower. That's where he got Oh, that's picked right. Up. That's yeah. right. He was a block yeah. away. Okay. Correct. Wow. Right. So, wow. So then. So then, you know, because New York has terrible laws, he's let out and he comes to L.A. with the specific purpose of trying to find me, kidnap me, rape me and kill me. So he comes to L.A. and now I'm on high alert. I'm terrified. He tried to kidnap my dog from the dog groomer. He starts stalking Kim Kardashian as well. I start working with her security team thinking, oh, for sure, her ex massage security team, they're going to get him. We're going to be good, right? Because who's scary? Well, they didn't, they, didn't, so intense. they didn't help her in Paris when they got, you know, that diamond stolen. But well, anyway. <laughs> well, here, well, right. So, so here's here's where I'm going with that. So, um, so 2017, uh, my stalker is stalking me. He tried to kidnap my dog. He goes to where I get my eyelashes done. He's scaring all the way. Like, it's just a really, really scary time. Of course, that's right when I just started dating my husband. So I'm like, welcome to my life. But, you know, that, that's how it is for us. Um, and so what ended up happening was he writes me because, remember, he's very unwell. Most stalkers don't do this, but mine does. He writes me and he says, I know you go to L.A. Comic Con. I'm going to go there and kidnap you. What he doesn't know is that I know the owners of L.A. Comic Con. So I work with them directly. We hire extra security dress them up as Batman and Superman to not scare the children. And sure enough, when he came there with the intention of kidnapping me, we caught him, not LAPD. We caught him ourselves, held him down and waited until LAPD came to pick him up. Right. For the violations of the restraining order that I had. So you were. Wait, 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 wait. Hold on a second. So you were at some point able to get a restraining order. When were you able to get the restraining order? Sure. My my first restraining order was 2015. What actually had happened, I had a very lucky break. What happened was I had a pending restraining order in the computer and I was unsure how I was going to serve him. But he went to the Silicon Valley office of a woman he went to high school with. He announced himself as being there and that he was Superman and he intended to rape her. And when he did that, the police were called. He was detained and not arrested. They saw my pending restraining order and they served him. So that was a lucky break for me. Yeah. So I had I had four thousand. I know because I did my own discovery on my trial. Four thousand violations of my restraining order. So when people say, "Oh, you know, get a restraining order," whatever, they don't always move no. on every violation. I I, no. I had a group, people don't understand that. I had four thousand, and I say four thousand terrifying violations, right? So yeah. Hold, I hold on. Hold, myself. hold on one second, because I do want to clarify that you bring up a, a very good point, and I get asked this question mm-hmm. all the time. The thing about a restraining order, well, first of all, it's twofold, right? Every case is different. So, like, in my case, when I moved away and he didn't know where I was anymore, I didn't want to serve him because I didn't want him to know where not to go, 
right? So, you know, some cases are, are different like that. But in the grand scheme of restraining orders, the reason that you have to get a restraining order is because in order, the, unfortunately, the way our laws read, and they do read different in every state and every county, all that. So you, if you're being stalked out there, um, need to do your research and go down to the police station and, and see um, how their stalking laws read. But in general, in order to prove a case of stalking, you have to prove a laundry list of behavior, including felony stalking, including having that restraining order. That's one of many different, yeah. Yeah. you know, behaviors that you have to show. So you know, right. it's only it's a piece of paper. I mean, you know very well that no no yeah. restraining order is going to keep him away. But um, right. But you had it. At least you had it. Correct. It Correct. You. So I. Ha Right. So I had the 4,000 violations. I caught him myself. I turned him. And again, my case was with TMU at that point. I still caught him myself. Very important thing to note. So um, we delivered him as he was, you know, brought in to LAPD. He was then served restraining orders by Kim Kardashian. The entirety of the WME, which are which is the big for people who don't or aren't in entertainment. That's one of the biggest um, entertainment agencies that represents actors and everybody. Um, and then... Uh, Gwyneth Paltrow served him with a restraining order. I'm unclear, but there was some incident with him and her child, something where he did something inappropriate at her school. So this is a problem person. So what ended up happening was he was there on a million dollars bail, which is also very unique, but my case was high profile and that I'm so grateful that's what they decided to do. Now, LA County, we don't even have bail, which is really a whole other conversation. Oh, he don't been get released. me started, Lenora. You know, right. you know how I feel right, about right. all that. Right. So he was held on a million dollars bail. A year later, the day we were set to have the trial, I get there, you know, with my victim impact statement. I'm ready to go. I've been waiting at this point like nine years to get to, to get here. Finally, your DA, day in court. Finally, your right, day in and, court. That I know that feeling the, well. Yep. Right. Only what happens is the DA meets me outside and says, um, we've decided to take a plea for felony stalking yep. max. And I was like, but but all the other, and they're just like, that's what we think is best. And we advise you not to give your victim impact statement because we can't compel a judge to get more time. He's already agreed to felony stalking max. So we think that if you speak, it's just gonna fire him up. And I'm just like, okay. And then, you know, California, we have this Proposition 57, which it's really, I get why people voted for it. It was very misleading. The way it sort of put out to the public is nonviolent offenders early release. So you hear that and you're like, okay, nonviolent, but you don't understand the crimes that our state considers nonviolent, which in includes rape of an unconscious person, forced sodomy, human trafficking, and stalking. So even though the, the sentence for felony stalking max in California should be a four-year term, it's automatically reduced to two. That's right. not good behavior. That's just immediate. So he served two years. Um, I... I got married October of 2019 because I, I knew he'd be getting out that December. He gets out December of 2019. He reoffends and is making YouTube videos about me three days later. You know, um, I have an ankle monitor on him. One of the things that I've been trying to advocate for. So now our new district attorney, Gascon, he's created for the first time in Los Angeles. We're called the Crime Victims Advisory Board. They've chosen nine of us from around the city, and I'm there advocating for gender-based crimes. So I'm there you know, for domestic violence, sexual assault, and stalking. And even though I'm not really public about it, I've actually experienced all three at different times with different people. So I'm, I'm there to, you know, advocate for everybody who's, who's being victimized in that way. But, whew, so there's like a whole lot. So okay, wait, wait, I, wait. I just yeah. want to take you back to that for a second. Um, mm -hmm. Because, you know, you and I talk, I'm, I am not political. I do not care. Yeah. But Gascon and what he is doing is is destroying, you know, our, our lovely city of Los Angeles with crime because of what you're saying. But what kind of impact, like what are you doing on that advisory board? What what kind of action yeah. and work is being yeah. done? Yeah, Gascon was 47, not 57. So I don't want to conflate the two there. I just want to right. make a big distinction right. about that. Um, right. And that was vote and that was voted. So. I understand that he's a controversial figure, but I will say I very much admire that he's brought this board in because before there was a lot of gatekeeping in DA's offices and they weren't specifically asking victims, how can we improve services? And that's what we're there for. Like right now I'm working on creating an app for the DA's office 
so people could have access to information that never existed. So all of us on the board, we're there representing different areas of crimes. There's a lot of people who have relatives who were homicide victims, right? So we're all there as genuine crime survivors, right? Who are trying to improve. Because if you're at the DA's office, something horrible has happened to you. Right. So we're right. there We're there to work. And it really has nothing to do with Gascon and his policy. We're not there for that. We're there to improve victim services and be outreach to our various communities. Because for example, like I have a, a social media presence, right? So I can get on my social media and be like, hey, have you ever heard of victim's compensation? Did you know you can get $5,000 in therapy? Bet you didn't, right? Where normally right. you don't have anybody at the DA's office that's like reaching the kind of people that I reach. So that's, exactly. that's why we're there. And it's a really yeah. beautiful group. And I just hope that wherever people fall politically, they see the, the cause we're kind of separate. Like we're, yeah, we're it's survivors, not, right? That that has nothing to do with politics. It's you know it really you're doesn't. you're trying to help. By the way, I just have to tell you something. So when I was kidnapped, I got um, well uh, victim restitution. You know, money from the government. So do you? I have it framed in my office. Um, my life was worth um, ninety nine dollars. That's like the cross the board, uh, you know, here's what you get. That was back in 1990. You know, maybe we've gotten a raise. Maybe some victims have gotten a raise since then. But $99, mm -hmm. that's what they put on my my life. So, I've never been able to collect mine. Oh. So I'm, I'm worth $0. And that's, you know, the, the value of, of our life. But no, it really, so really, really is important to have victim advocacy because it's so true when you, you know, you're exactly right. If you're in the DA's office, something terrible has gone on, right? And you're totally. now in this sea. And by the way, this is a, I think this was really hard for me at the beginning to understand too, because remember it's the state or the city versus the stalker, not you. So you don't, and, and right. I, you're, you and I are so much alike, which we know. And, um, you know, I wanted to get in there. I wanted to, you know, but you're at the mercy of some assistant DA that's got a stack of right. rape and murder cases on his desk or mm -hmm. her desk, mm -hmm. and they mm -hmm. just got to mm -hmm. go in and they're just churning through their day. So you're just one little spoke in the cog. I mean, it's it's terrible. So to have yeah. the victim's advocacy is so great because, you know, it, 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 it really is important work. Yeah, it, it really is. And so I'm, I'm really proud of the board. It's a really, it's a diverse group of people and diverse experiences. And it's just really beautiful that we're able to work with victim services. Like I think I told you the other day, I found out that, so our DA office, right? There's like eight, 800 employees, I think it's it's huge. It's the, the biggest in the United States. And our victim services department, I can't remember the exact amount. I think it's it's supposed to have 80. I think they're under people right now, but there wasn't one dedicated expert for stalking, right? So right, so right now, I'm trying to trying to get that for us, and I, it looks positive. So um, you know, before this, that wouldn't have been a thing, and that makes sense because when my case was at the DA's office, no one told me that victim services existed because there was nobody dedicated to stalking to come find me. Right, right. That's it. I, my I had the same experience that there there was there was just nobody. To help. Mm -hmm. The only thing is, mm -hmm. is right after I was kidnapped, actually, I think he was still holding the police at bay on my friend and I was back at the police station, you know, trying to give them all this information. And they brought in this psychiatrist that's their police psychiatrist. The guy was like 80 years old, smoking a pipe. I kid you not. And I'm just like, and he's like, tell me how you're feeling. You know what I mean? I'm like, F off, buddy. Get the hell. What the hell? Yeah, it was, that's, it that's was not ridiculous. What you need that yeah, it was ridiculous. But anyway, um, so going back to your stalker, where mm -hmm. is he right now? Yeah, so he's currently in jail in Los Angeles for yet again violating my restraining order and my probation conditions. He should be getting out, I believe, mid September. I'm sure he'll reoffend and go back in. We're not going to pretend it's anything else. He just keeps doing things and going back. And this is the revolving door that I live with. It's good. It's, it's good, at least now that you have some traction in the you know criminal world. At least he has a record. At least you can bring it up now and, and he, they can see the whole history. So it's terrible that you have to live, yeah. you know, because the thing about stalkers 
is that honestly, truly, the behavior is non-curable. And, you know, sometimes people lose interest. Sometimes it was more of a domestic violence stalking. So, mm -hmm. you know, it kind of fades. But, but the true, um, you know, sociopath, schizophrenic, mentally ill stalkers, you know, it's tough because yeah. as a victim, you never really know if that person yeah. is going to show up you just always have to live that way. But you have learned and I have learned how to build that perimeter of safety right. around you virtually and physically. And you know the drill now. So as soon as, you know, something happens, you're in, you know, that mode where you're going to go down and you're going to, again, approach the, the law enforcement and get him picked up off the street, which is yeah. really- I do it myself as I have before. Yeah, exactly. Or get your own private security and do it again. But you know, you and I are, 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 both of us were very lucky in our, in our situations, but we know of millions of people out there oh, yeah. that, that don't have our tenacity, not that, but yeah. you know what I mean? It's, it's just very hard the for them. Hypervigilance. It's yeah. so hard. And, and it's, and you and I, we have so much privilege, you know, and we have to always say that too. There's a lot of people that are coming with with a lot less and we have to be really realistic about how it is for them. Yeah, it's it's terrible. That's why like on my website, my books and you the more information we can get out there to victims of all walks of life, the better so that they actually have the tools to, you know, help themselves if they are being stalked. So the more we talk about this, I think it's the, the better. Um, so tell me about, well, let me ask you this. How do you live? I mean, I always said when, um, when my stalker was in prison or in jail, you know, the billions of violations and restraining orders that he did over the years, you know, as a stalking victim, that's the only time that you truly feel like you can breathe, right? Right. And I and I remember your wedding. Unfortunately, I threw out my back and I couldn't go to your beautiful I know. wedding. Oh, yeah. Darn it. But um, but I know that that was a sense of peace that you could enjoy your wedding in peace because you knew he was behind bars. Um, but now. How do you feel? I mean, how do you live? Honestly? Yeah. I mean, the, tr the truth is. I've done all the things as far as risk minimization for myself that I feel is it's about as good as it gets, but I'm really terrified he's going to kill somebody else. And that is not an easy way to live, you know? So I constantly have, have that feeling and do whatever I can to put him away as frequently as possible. But that is a very scary thing because I can control my behavior and protect myself, but not that, you know, cute girl working at Starbucks that he's going to fixate on. Like, I don't know how to protect somebody in the future other than doing this. You know, there's a lot of things that I always tell people to do. I show them how to wipe their address off the internet. That's a really important one. People don't realize for a whole dollar, I can find out everything about you. Oh yeah. Um, if you own, uh huh. If you own property, you know, put it in a trust, not in your name. Otherwise it's public record. And that's always easy to find as well. Um, you know, there's, there's just a lot of risk minimization. I sort of, I sort of say it's, it's like wearing a condom, you know, it's, it's, it's not a hundred percent foolproof, but it sure as hell increases your odds of, of being safer and all the sort of layers, as you say, of building in protection. It does matter. We're both here. We're both proof of that. Right. Um, also with my wedding specifically, I wanted, cause a lot of, you know, just like crime survivors follow you, they follow me as well. And I wanted them to see that you deserve a happy ending, right? Like we are not a product of the worst thing that's happened to us and our trauma. And there's people who will love and accept us. And even if we have these situations, you know, there's there's people, it's it's not easy. This is not for everybody, but there there's people who will stand by us. So I just, I wanted to sort of broadcast that to everybody. But, Very um, but true. as far as me, mm -hmm, and people don't talk about that, you know, all the other ways it impacts our life. Like, well, I remember- I lost jobs. Oh yeah. Well, I lost roommates. I lost, you know, um, imagine just like you said, I mean, I've had to sit down with boyfriends cause you know, I, my stalker started stalking me my junior year of college and then kidnapped me after I'd gotten married. So, I mean, you know, I went through a couple guys before I met my now ex-husband, but anyway, so my point is, is like, you have to sit down and have that conversation. So, I just kind of feel like I need to let you know that I have this um, psychotic person that comes after me with semi-automatic weapons and knives. And, um, you know, 
It's, it really ruins your yeah. dating game. <laughs> you know. It really but. does. And especially because everybody, like, they Google you before that date. So I was yeah. just kind of, you know, it's all right. Is that, so, Lenora, yeah. is that why I haven't been dating? Do you think people are Googling me and going, I don't know. I, I, Honestly, for it's, but you know what? It's gonna get the wrong guys away. So good, filter them out. True. But yeah. Very it, you know, true. It's, I'm sure they Google and you know, but the right guy is gonna be like, oh, she's a badass. I'm all in. You know. So that's, it'll, <laughs> okay. It, it'll work out. Get that working way. on that. Get working on that. Yeah. Um, so you also are starting. To just tell me what 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 you're doing in addition to the victims advocacy work. Um, yeah. Yeah. What else? Yeah. So for the past 10 years, I've worked in entertainment. I've been a producer and a casting director. And then, you know, much like yourself, we do all the crime shows, right? And so it's a really unique position when you're both on camera and behind the scenes. And for most people don't realize this, that most of these true crime shows, which are in a sense profiting off of our pain, not all of them are ethical. Some of them are. Some of them are really wonderful. They treat you well and they help you tell your story and give you a platform. And others... They're just there to make you cry, manipulate your feelings, put you in danger, interview your stuff without your I consent. Just, you know, I like do. That. I was just about to say that I did. I did want to go back to that at how incredibly careless of 48 hours to interview your stalker. Because if anybody knows anything, you know, psychology wise, you do not promote the stalker. You do not pull them in like that. It inflames them immediately. In fact, I, I did years ago, Donahue, which you got to be my age or older to know who he is. But anyway, they ambushed me. I was on stage. They didn't have my stalker because he was in prison, but they had some random guy that had been um, in jail for a violation of restraining order and had been stalking a news anchor. And they had he and his attorney on to like, you know, uh, complain about the stalking laws as I'm on here. And oh no, at, at, oh, no. Com at commercial, oh, God. I looked at Donahue because the guy starts talking to me. He goes, oh, I live right around, you know, like he started talking to me like he knew me and knew where I lived. And I mm -hmm. looked at Donahue and I yelled. He was, he was over here and I said, you better get this guy away from me and you better yeah. have him stop talking to me. And Donahue comes over. He was, he's such a good man. He came over and told the guy to shut the hell up and stay away. And, and after the show, I made them escort them out. And I gave that producer uh, an earful. And that's the thing. If we're, you know, again, we're, we're used to being on television we're, now. And, you know, we're used to being advocates for ourselves. But, um, you know, it takes standing up for yourself because there's been many shows, too, that I won't do because they do exploit yeah. victims. And that's so, right. same thing. But so that's what's leading into what you're doing now. So keep going. Right, so it's tricky because you know you do the shows because you want the platform to tell your story and to educate. So you're grateful for it, but you're like, wait, you don't have to put me in danger. While well, it's a very complicated thing. So because I, I, I have a foot in both, right? In the advocacy world and entertainment, I decided to create a company. It's called Lenora Claire Consulting. And we do sort of three levels of service. The first level of service is I've gotten a bunch of other high profile crime victims who've done all the shows as well. And so for people who aren't in entertainment, there's a movement right now. They have these things called intimacy coordinators on set when there's like sex scenes to make sure that the actors are you know, treated properly, nobody's boundaries are, are messed with. And it's a really nice thing. What I was wondering is why the hell they don't have that for crime victims who were literally have a camera shoved in their face during the most vulnerable moment. So the first sort of tier of services is, you know, I have people like us who, who've actually lived it, survived it, who go and will be on set with the victims, making sure everything's OK, making sure their boundaries are respected, making sure if they need a minute that they get that minute and that they're not, you know, coerced into speaking if they're not comfortable. So we've never seen that before, and I hope I'm successful. The second level is consulting. You know, there's a lot of shows where they, they talk about crimes and they don't know what the hell they're talking about. So why wouldn't they, they usually get They usually get, you know, ex-law enforcement, Cops. Navy SEALs, right. all that stuff. They don't really go right. to... They don't talk to us. Right. Right. Did they, did they give you a paycheck to, to consult for you? They didn't call me for you, but that's a huge show about stalking. I don't... I would, we would know in the stalking community if they were advising with any of us. They're not. 
Right. You know, and you're right. They they go like I I know the guy who is the consultant on SVU, and he was with the actual New York SVU for 30 years, and that's wonderful. But that's one side of the story. That's not our side of the story. So it's consulting, and also the other level that's really I'm most excited to do with this is consulting. What I want to do is get like retainer agreements with production companies and networks where we can we can make recommendations about their content. Like the easiest example I have is for those of us who watch the night documentary, they had really brutal, gra like graphic crime scene photos of the victims. I'm sorry, but you don't need that to tell the story. You're just re-traumatizing the family. It, is, it also desensitizes us when we see these graphic depictions of brutality. The stories are enough. We don't need that. So why not have crime victims who sort of give recommendations and say like, hey, you know, why don't we use some trauma-informed language here? We could use a trigger warning here, maybe pull these photos, right? So consulting with us about how to make everything more ethical. I, I, as I said to you on the phone, we talked about it a little bit. It's kind of like cruelty-free eggs. You know, there's, there's, <laughs> there's a, right? It's like just the idea of knowing that everybody involved was treated properly right. and that there's not this extra level of gross. And then the third level of services are where you could you could independently hire on camera experts. So if there was like a show about stalking, like they would see you on there and go, oh, my God, she's amazing. We'd love to have her speak rather than somebody, you know, who graduated from YouTube University and doesn't know what the hell they're talking about, which we see so often. Right. So I'm really excited about it. This, nothing like this has ever existed. That's so victim centered and gives us a voice in the media because. I'm sure as your listeners know, true crime is so hot right now that right. we're not given we're not given the respect that we deserve. We're not being treated properly. And so, you know, here I am to sort of get basically unionize us kind of and get us all together. <laughs> and, and right. you know, and we've never really done that before. Also, not to mention, I think it's important for all of us survivors that do media to talk and to be like, you know what? We don't like this producer. They treated us poorly, so we can all look out for each other because yeah. that also has oh, existed. I, I can I can tell a few oh, stories. I, oh, no doubt, no yeah. doubt. I mean, it's it's the same thing. Like like I actually love doing Doctor Oz. He's so sweet. He's so yeah. wonderful. That's a, it's a and professional crew, an extremely yes. professional crew. Totally, <clears throat> totally. So, for example, if someone asked me, I would say, oh, I've, I've done it twice. They've been wonderful. Green light, you know, but right, other right. shows, I would not say that. Yeah, exactly. Well, I, I just have to say um, what an incredible story and an incredible journey you, you, you have taken and what you've done with this negative. I always, you know, this show is about ordinary people doing extraordinary things out of trauma and tragedy and you are a prime prime example of that so where can people find you yeah so my name lenora claire it's my website it's all the social media just find me lenora claire at everything except my twitter my twitter got hijacked but you know, uh, who cares about Facebook. twitter anymore we yeah, don't care tw about twitter twitter sucks. twitter sucks yeah um and then le the the consulting website if there's anybody in the industry or just who wants to learn more it's lenora claire LLC.com. And I'll have, you know, on my website, I have my podcast page and on this show, we'll have the links to, to, to everything. It was so great having you here today. I really, really yeah, appreciate it. Great. It's been a long time coming. So thank you so much. Yeah. And thank you again. Like I say, you're, you're my, you're my sister survivor and you really, <laughs> you, you really, you really blaze that trail. And, it's, you know, and so like, I can't not bring that up because it's so major. Thank, thank you. you. Thanks so much. If you or someone you know is being stalked, get help. Go down to your local police station and meet with a detective. Tell them what's going on, share with them what's going on, and any evidence you have, bring it down to the station. Contact the Stalking Resource Center. They're a great resource to find out what you need to do to help get your stalker arrested. The number, 202-467-8700. Eight seven zero zero. Again, that's 202-467-8700, the Stalking Resource Center. Till next time. She's like the female James Bond. She's the safety chick. The safety chick. I love that safety chick. That's yeah. what she calls herself. The safety chick. I was a stalking victim, having to learn every possible aspect of personal safety to stay alive. The safety chick. We love her. Yeah.